extreme, xenophobic, and uh, radical Christianist right wing. And the United States, you've seen an alliance between the main pro-Israel organizations and uh, the extreme, often anti-Semitic, anti radical Christian right. And it's often anti-immigrant, racist, etc., etc. And that shift, I think, is one that was a fundamental strategic mistake by pro-Israel groups, because the majority are not there. Now, you may see the United States from Canada as being a bunch of crazies, <laughs> but the reality is that, you know, the, the, the extreme right of the United States is big, it's strong, but it, it's probably about 30% that will consistently vote for these. You know, they can win because they can, you know, mobilize people more than others. But it's not a constituency that you can grow out of. And the Israelis have recognized the contradiction between trying to, between making that your base and trying to market Israel as a progressive, liberal, Western, uh, you know, lovely democracy. And that's why we see these rather desperate Hasbara propaganda tactics now of trying to sell Israel as you know, gay-friendly environment. For, all those are fine courses. I, I, you know, that's, but I mean, supposing tomorrow Israeli scientists invented a cure for cancer, we'd all be very grateful. We'd all say, that's absolutely fantastic. That's going to benefit all of humanity. But what we wouldn't say is, and so now it's okay for you to be an apartheid state. <laughs> and imagine, like, wasn't, wasn't the first heart transplant done by a South African uh, surgeon. This was great. How many lives has his pioneering work saved? But no one said, well, you invented heart transplants, therefore apartheid is okay. So these policies simply will not work. These strategies won't convince people anymore when they see the reality on the ground. So I want to end, coming up to an hour, uh, is that so the point I wanted to make there is that Zionism and the Israeli state are at an ideological dead end. They can no longer cover up the reality, the racist, apartheid, colonial reality. Uh, they have nowhere to go. They, have, they offer no vision. Their tactic, delayed tactic of going along with the fake peace process while building and building and building has come to an end. No one buys that anymore. Uh, the world is waking up to it, even in North America, as the BBC opinion poll shows. <clears throat> this makes them very vulnerable. Two, a good thing, call for equality, universal human rights, an end to these awful practices. The broader regional context, and I want to end with some comments about this, really give us hope. I was spent uh, most of January and uh, half of February in between Qatar and Amman. I was actually supposed to go to Gaza, but uh, my ticket to Cairo was, uh, I think, on the 26th or 27th of January. And if you told me, would you cancel your trip to Gaza, uh, you know, so the Egyptians can have a revolution and get rid of Hosni Barak, I'd say, of course, yes. So I wasn't at all bothered by this, but I didn't get to go to, to Gaza. But um, this also undermines the, the racist and culturalist notion that you know Arabs are incapable of democracy or don't want it. And it has exposed the reality that these dictatorships were supported by um, uh, the United States and other Western countries, and that the Obama administration <coughs> was doing all it could to save Mubarak, or to save the Mubarak regime. At a certain point, they were ready to get rid of uh, uh, Mubarak in order to preserve the regime, and to install the torturer Omar Suleiman as uh, uh, Mubarak's successor. And the Egyptian people foiled that plan. They foiled the American counter-revolution. But what Tunisia and Egypt show us is that the revolution has continued. Tunisia 
just yesterday announced that it was abolishing its state security police, the first Arab country to do so, to get rid of the whole system of political policing and control of the population that has been a standard feature. And most of these mukhabarat, as we call them, these security agencies, have worked closely with the Western uh, security agencies and, and governments. Uh, Egypt is following the same path. Citizens took over the uh, Amn al-Dawla, the headquarters of the state security police in Cairo. And we are seeing real deep transformations taking place. People aren't saying, okay, we overthrew the, the head and that's it. They are continuing. And these rebels, and even if the, the change doesn't come in the same form in all countries, the pressure is there. Egypt's regional role will change. You know, all the worry was in the United States and other countries was, oh, will Egypt tear up its peace treaty with Israel? I think it probably won't if I was to guess. But the peace treaty never required Egypt to carry on the way it has. Never required Egypt to uh, be complicit in Israel's crimes, in the siege in Gaza, to, to uh, be the, the linchpin or the keystone in a, uh, a sectarian regional alliance against Iran. None of this was in the peace treaty. And we already see Egypt's foreign policy shifting, even though the revolution isn't complete. And taking Egypt out of the American-Israeli camp to play a more independent role and to return to the Arab fold. So you have regional shifts in the balance of power that I think favor justice in the long run. And the transformations show a point that I've tried to make many times over the year, years, is that, you know, there's a fallacy that we all engage in, that we think uh, that is true for us personally and also true for us collectively or as countries or communities, that because every day that you know, every yesterday, today is a lot like yesterday. Yesterday is a lot like the day before, and so on. So we think tomorrow is going to be the same as today. But the reality is that, heaven forbid, you could find out you have a terrible illness. You could win the lottery. You could get your dream job. You could meet the love of your life. There's no guarantee that tomorrow is going to be exactly like today. And this is also true for countries. And we've seen this so many times in history, that, uh, that when change comes, it's not that it was unpredicted. For years and years, people have been speculating about the possibility of uh, Arab peoples rising up against their governments. But nobody could predict the moment. Nobody could predict the spark. Nobody could imagine that Muhammad Bouazizi in the town of Sidi Bouazizi would get so fed up that he would set himself on fire and inspire his countrymen to, uh, to, to revolt until they had cleansed the old regime. So radical change is possible. We've seen that. And we need to prepare for it. We need to be building. We need to be engaging, mobilizing in boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And we need to be thinking about the future. What kind of Palestine can be a hospitable home for all the people who live in it? I think that is our urgent challenge. And it's one that we can achieve. For me personally, I, I don't think this is a project that is 20, 30, or 50 years, I think about the generation of Palestinians who witnessed the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing in 1948, who are still alive today. Most of them are getting quite on in years. They may be our parents or our grandparents, and I think we owe it to them to, to uh, let them to see this justice in their life.
announcements before we get on to the question and answer. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the Regina Public Interest Research Group for helping to make these events possible, in addition to the personal credit cards of some of our members. And to that end, we will be passing along a box for anyone who's able to contribute a donation to some of the significant expenses for this series of events, um, which have all been really open to the public, so if anyone can help us out, that would be greatly appreciated and would also put us in a position to organize some more events in the future. Um, we'll also be passing around a sign-up sheet, so people are interested in hearing about upcoming events uh, or getting involved, then please leave us your contact information. And last but not least, uh, just a reminder to come out to the other events we have planned this Thursday. Uh, we've got an event focused on colonization and apartheid here at home. We'll be screening Ghana Sitake, which is about the Oka standoff in 1990, and we'll have a panel with Joyce Green and Sue Dumaje, who is introducing here tonight. And that's at the Luther Auditorium at 6.30 on Thursday, and next week we have uh, Huayda Araf um, from the International Solidarity Movement and the Free Gaza Campaign, who will be speaking also at the Luther Auditorium at 7 p.m. And lastly, a closing social event at Mysteria Gallery on Wednesday um, with Palestinian poet Rami Kanazi, who will be joining us from New York. So please check out our website, ReginaSolidarityGroup.com, for more details. And I'll pass it back to Ali for the question and answer. There's a mic, oops, there's a microphone, I think just one, but if people wanted to line up there with questions or comments, then uh, we welcome them all. Thank you. I, I noticed. I noticed that it's a very big box going around, so <laughs> quite the job to fill it. <laughs> Do your best to fill it. <laughs> I can uh, kind of see you. I have some bright lights in, in my face, so uh, whoever wants to step forward can do so. Israel is uh, unique in many ways, but I tend to view it, I think, most usefully through the lens of settler colonialism. And I think you can learn a lot about Israel by looking at the experience of other settler colonial societies. And, uh, uh, and here I think the comparisons with South Africa and Northern Ireland are very useful. Um, Without going into great detail, there are, there are similarities in, in, kind of in the setup that this was that the, the ruling group was descended from a settler community, that there was some distinction made in Northern Ireland, it was along the lines of religion between settler and native in South Africa. Of course, it was a racial distinction. Uh, and you see that the ruling group develops an ideology of. Um, sort of a, a mirror ideology to the way people outside that group see them. Uh, so you see this very much with, with Israelis, with Afrikaners, with uh, unionists and loyalists in Northern Ireland, that, that we are the oppressed group, the whole world is against us, uh, that we have a special covenant with God, that uh, our very survival and existence is at stake. Uh, why does the world pick on us? Can't they see? You know that we are right and everyone else is wrong, and so there are some common features that you see. So I think that the, um, on the one hand, the specific features of Israel is you see this growth of messianic religious Zionism 